not talking just so we can cut out any other sound and and to make it easier for for us to hear each other um, I also wanted to say that we're approaching this event in the way that we do all Photographers Gallery events, um, which is with the name of creating a forum of trust and mutual respect. I ask us all to keep that in mind. The event will last roughly an hour, so depending on discussion, we should finish here just after 7.30 local time. And now to introduce our chair for this evening, um, who will then in turn introduce Maya Goodfellow and Luke Dodd. Natalie Fenton. <coughs> is Professor of Media and Communications at Goldsmiths University of London, where she is co-director of the Centre for the Study of Global Media and Democracy. She was vice chair of the board of the campaign group Hacked Off for seven years um, and chair of the UK Media Reform Coalition for three years. She is now on the board of Declassified UK, an investigative journalism website for in-depth analysis on British foreign policy. Her most recent books are Media, Democracy and Social Change, Reimagining Political Communications, published by SAGE, and The Media Manifesto, published by Polity, um, and they were both published in 2020. And um, her essay, Corruption in the Fourth Estate, How the Guardian Exposed Phone Hacking and Reneged on Reform of Press Regulation, also appears in this book. Um, uh, and so uh, it's called Cap Capitalism's Conscience, 200 Years of the Guardian, edited by Des Freeman and published this year by Pluto Press. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much, Janice, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, the journalist Gary Young, in his chapter on the book that Janice has just referred to, states that the Guardian has an historic relationship to liberal values. And Des Friedman, the editor, notes that that commitment to liberalism and serving a market for educated liberals is explicitly hostile to transformative social change. That book discusses how we can see that in an increasingly risk averse response to things like the security state, its coverage of Jeremy Corbyn and its ultimate rejection of the Leveson framework for press regulation, despite exposing the illegality that led to the inquiry in the first place. And there's also a great chapter in that book on The Guardian's lack of a clear stand on things like racism and immigration. In the great essay by Nezreen Malik that accompanies this exhibition that you can find on um, online, she notes, and this is a quote from her, in the photographs taken over the years, the distinction between us and them is ever present. A reflection of the fact that those behind the images themselves, the journalists, editors and photographers, hail from the peaceful center, the heart of an establishment of male and white comfort. The liberal eye, which is a great concept that she has here, is not exempt from the hazards of centering its own perspective. So throughout this discussion over the next hour, we're gonna be exploring whether the Guardian's purpose wrapped up maybe with um, liberalism with a small L and conservatism with a small C, leaves it ultimately colluding with power rather than holding it to account while purporting to do something else. And we want him, of course, um, to focus in particular on the role photography has played in the liberalism uh, the Guardian embodies. We have two fantastic panelists to kick off this discussion. I'm delighted to introduce Luke Dodd of the Guardian Foundation and co-curator of the Picture Library exhibition. He's a graduate of Trinity College Dublin and the Whitney Museum Independent Study Programme in New York. His projects include the establishment of the National Museum of the 1840s Irish Famine in Strokestown Park, County Roscommon, the establishment of the Guardian Observer Archive, several books and a film related to the work of the legendary observer photographer Jane Bowne, as well as curating Easter Rising 1916's Sexton Collection at the Photographer's Gallery. We also um, have with us Dr. Maya Goodfellow, who is a writer and academic specialising in the relationships between race, bordering and capitalism. She's currently the Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellow at the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute at the Sheffield University. And she's also a visiting research fellow at the University College London Sarah Parker Ramon Centre for the study of racism and racialization. Her first fantastic book, do read it if you haven't already, Hostile Environment, How Immigrants Became Scapegoats, was published with Verso in 2020. 
and was long listed for the Jalak Prize. Um, Maya's written for The Guardian, The New York Times, among other media publications and appearances. Each of our panelists is gonna talk for about 10 minutes. Then we'll have an initial discussion amongst the panel before opening out to questions and comments from the floor. And as Janice has already said, please do use the chat function to either indicate you have a question you'd like to ask, or indeed to put that question directly into the chat box itself. And I'll pick up as many as we can when we get to that point. But for now, Luke, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to represent the exhibition. I'm going to show a couple of slides of the installation because um, many people may not have been able to get to the um, gallery and also give a flavour of the images which are um, on display. Um, the, I'm just making sure that I have shared the screen. OK, it's coming now. Here we go. So the, um, the exhibition consists of about 250 photographs taken from probably close to a million um, that have been largely collected by The Guardian over the course of the 20th century. Um, the Guardian first used a photograph in 1905 and basically the library, as it was called, rather than the archive, grew. Um, incrementally, I mean, fairly sedately from up until about the 1960s, and then a great explosion with, um, you know, sort of a, um, technology in terms of printing, colour supplements, colour photography. So I suppose the important thing in putting this exhibition together, the thing that really came home to me is the fact that photographs were always secondary to the text. Um, and that's kind of important to, and I think it probably still pertains. And the subject and the photographs as well, ironically, even though they purport to represent um, a kind of, um, you know, objective reality, are highly contextualized. And that's something that um, continued right through until the picture library was more or less disbanded in about 2000 when um, digital technology took over. The Guardian, as probably everybody knows, started off in Manchester. It um, moved a major editorial bit to London in the 1960s. A second picture library was set up there. The two were eventually um, brought together, but not integrated, interestingly. And um, the picture library really, or the, the, the material which has all now been archived, really does give an extraordinary view into how um, a, a picture desk in a newspaper worked. And it is, I'm not sure, I think the Times has a very good picture archive as well, but um, I think there might be the only two newspapers um, that have looked after their heritage properly. We, the, the way in which the sort of um, pictures are displayed are a mixture of vitrines, wall um, display cases and um, some frame material. I mean, the, the, the way the picture library developed was very ad hoc. There were two subject categories, one for people and one for subjects, um, and it just grew exponentially. And it seemed to depend a great deal on um, any individual picture librarian or indeed picture editor um, until such time as it became huge. I mean, the, the, the picture um, editor now accesses something like 40,000 images a day for all of the stuff that goes online. Um, so this really is looking at something um, which operated in a completely different way. Um, the, the picture on the right um, that you can see on the wall is actually the first picture desk with um, Walter Doughty, the first staff photographer who was appointed in um, the early part of the 20th century. Um, what we've tried to do with the exhibition was present the images with as much of the original context as possible. And in some cases, that's quite jarring because certain terminology is used that would be completely inappropriate. And at the same time, in a couple of cases, and I'll come back to this later, um, we've sort of recontextualized it in terms of, you know, more contemporary sort of bringing it up to date. Um, so these are, and in the early sort of yellow section, the introductory section, 
um, of the gallery, um, many of the themes, you know, which have to do with the kind of things that Natalie mentioned earlier on, you know, and Maya's work in particular, you know, the themes that have, I suppose, flowered so gloriously under Brexit in the last um, decade or two, um, obviously around racism um, and immigration. This gives another view back down into the space. I'll just move through these quickly. And what we tried to do with the um, display was to keep the kind of random nature of the uh, of the way in which the material is organized, because um, you might have a Cartier-Bresson photograph cheek by jowl with something which is completely, you know, probably never used. So there was no hierarchy employed. Just as, a, as an image was used, um, this gives a, a sense of, you know, the kind of disparate um, eclectic nature of the collection. As images were used, they tended to have a lot of material stuck on the back of them. These are all working images. This is a, obviously a shot from the 1960s of immigrants arriving at Gatwick. Um, the whole top section of the photograph has been painted out, presumably because um, it was disruptive or there was something in the image that wouldn't have worked on the page. Crop lines visible, um, staining in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, a lot of information was included on the back, and we have a section of this, you know, in the exhibition which shows this. Um, every time an image was used, it was date stamped. Sometimes the original article that the image um, accompanied or the headline was stuck, as in this case here. Lots of um, lots of annotations. The name of the photographer here, Frank Martin. Very much working prints. You can see how this image was cropped down to just include the baby in the middle rather than the one on the right, and the father was um, completely excluded. So, you know, just to give a flavor of how things were put together, because this presumably would have been over two columns of type. So the full image wouldn't have worked. Um, very strange things then, this the very controversial purchase by the Tate of Carol Andres Bricks in the 1960s. And a, a man, the man on the right, his legs have been airbrushed out completely in order to make the image work on the page. And then, you know, there's a great deal of this kind of material. Remember, the paper had its origins in the in the in in northern England. So there's a good deal of this kind of um, um, image. You can see again the underside of the um, man on the right, his arms have been painted and the t-shirt of the other guy in order to give a greater contrast on the page. Guardian is, you know, obviously as a kind of liberal leaning paper, very much campaigning, good deal of um, strikes, industrial action, demonstrations, Greenham Common. And then the kind of more interesting images. This is one of the really extraordinary images that was found in the archive of Annie Kenny, a suffragette leader. And in a sense, this is when we talk about trying to recontextualize some of the images. Um, this is um, a woman who was working class, unlike most of the other suffragettes. And C.P. Scott had a good deal of dealings with the suffragettes, but um, he sort of shied away from giving Annie Kenny too much because she was regarded as militant. You know, they, this flies to the heart of the kind of dilemma for the liberal, you know, like as soon as um, violence is involved, then um, she was um, sort of sidelined. And Again, as um, Natalie made reference to the Nezrin Malik essay, which accompanies the exhibition, talks. I mean, in a sense, I think you know, like reading, rereading it again today. I mean, her 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 view seems to be that um, the Guardian is quite good when it's on home turf, dealing with industrial relations or with um, feminism or gay rights or you know, but things tend to get um, difficult, you know, or maybe it's that the the sort of colonial past casts a very long shadow. So you get these kind of images that would not be, you know, used at all now. You know, a, a, a white figure of authority sitting um, with um, people of color around him, you know, ridiculous images. Um, a very interesting image. In one case in the exhibition, we tried, this is an image by Neil Libert from, I think, the 1960s, but it was used again and again in the paper throughout the 70s on four different occasions. This is the reverse of the image. And it, it's kind of like a stock image of a vagrant, I think it's called, uh, in Harlem in New York. But it was used over and over again to illustrate completely different um, stories um, based in America. Um, 
the, again, the kind of thing that would not be allowed now. Uh, similarly, Frank Martin's image from Brixton in the 1970s used on numerous occasions to talk about immigration in Britain and the sort of difficulties. Um, but then, you know, Nezreen does make um, reference to, there was an extraordinary um, campaign in the 1970s on the Guardian's pages. Um, these are images that are not um, the byline, you know, largely because they were from apartheid South Africa, the photographer was never acknowledged, but like a real campaign that started that led to a, you know, public um, commission or a parliamentary commission into the conditions of British owned um, farms in South Africa and the conditions of the, the, the people who work in them. So those are some of the issues that we might come back to. I'm conscious we have to move on. Um, so I will talk to you again in a bit. Thank you very much, Luke, and perfect timing there. And we can we can go back to some of those ideas. Just a very quick question. You mentioned in the presentation that there are certain pictures that you think wouldn't be used today. Is that, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because what struck me in the exhibition was just how many pictures show how little has changed. You know, we still have protests around, um, you know, women's um, rights. We still have protests around pay and conditions of labor. We still have protests uh, around um, immigration and racism. And, you know, we're, it's almost you could just pick out those pictures and put them in the contemporary day and say nothing has shifted in that period of time. But then you refer to this idea that there are certain pictures that simply wouldn't be acceptable today. Is that, does that signal something has shifted or is that just a refocusing of the liberal eye? Um, I think both of those things. I think it's um, it's things shift all the time and the Guardian you know is a wonderful talking shop you know it, it constantly sort of talks about what it should do and what it shouldn't do and maybe not enough changes but for example you know there's a really stark image in the exhibition of a Biafran famine um, victim um, from the 1970s which would never be used now because I think there's a general acceptance that that all that does is perpetuate sort of views of um, famine victims. Um, also, I think there is now sort of a, an idea that you would never use an image of somebody without naming them. There was a big debate within the last 20 years at The Guardian where um, somebody dead of color was, um, a photograph was printed on the page and there was a big controversy about that because that would never happen if it was somebody white or sort of um, from this culture. So things, move along but I think within the broader framework of what the Guardian is which is a you know liberal left-leaning but part of the establishment um maybe not enough has changed yeah that pulls up an interesting point actually made by Lee in the chat box as well about you know it's something to do with that and um, who is the subject and the object and the unnaming the right of the photographer to just take this picture and represent this person in a particular way without giving them any agency or any identification even is something that um, uh, Lee raises um, very right. And, and, and photography is, you know, by its nature, predatory. You yeah. are taking something from somebody. Um, and, and, and at least 99% of the images in this exhibition are by men and they were edited by men. Women are very were not represented in in either you know the sort of picture desks or as photographers or you know with with a few notable exceptions and those power dynamics i think and the inequality of power in throughout with between those people i think is a very nice segue over to um, maya's presentation so thank you very much maya and over to you uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm going to time myself so I don't try not to go over. Um, so I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Luke mentioned and that Nesri Malik uh, touched on in her piece. And I think um, some themes that I, I think Natalie will also have quite a lot of interesting things to, to um, say about. Um, and that's specifically thinking about how we might understand how the liberal media represents certain dominant thinking um, while sort of suggesting that it's trying to subvert that thinking. And I want to think specifically about race, immigration and actually also international development. And I'm not just going to think about The Guardian, but I will come back to The Guardian time and again. 
And so um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, as has already been suggested, I think we can think about how images and more broadly certain subjects and language gain meaning. And it's sort of quite an obvious point, but there obviously isn't necessarily one meaning when we look at it, an image. There's not necessarily one true meaning or one way to interpret what we are seeing, just as is the case with um, much other cultural production. And so there is, as Stuart Hall would say, an act of representation occurring. So how you represent an event can change the meaning of that event. But that act of representation is also becomes constitutive of the event. So if we think about this in practice in relation to migration, um, what you find when you look through uh, recent UK history, you find there are kind of recurring ideas that shape and determine how people are seen and how we understand certain events and certain subjects. And so if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, so racism and um, anti-immigration sentiment are often thought of as something that is the preserve of the right and the far right. And you sort of see that with this image. It's often we see in the media, in the liberal media in particular, representations of racism or anti-immigration sentiment is certain figures or certain groups, um, the far right groups or people like Nigel Farage. But the, this thinking, this often racialized um, anti-immigration thinking is also cultivated by the so-called liberal media through the normalization of certain forms of thinking around issues like immigration control. Um, so some of these stances have changed over time, and maybe this is something we could talk about in a moment. Often that changes thanks to really important resistance movements, but I think some of the underlying tenets of this thought remain the same throughout um, recent history. And so if we could move to the next slide, um, please. So one of the ways that anti-immigration sentiment has been made more respectable, in particular through the liberal media, is through the ventriloquization of the working class. So this idea that in particular the white working class um, is threatened by immigration. And, and here in this image, um, you see actually dock workers marching in support of Enoch Powell. Um, so we do see that anti-immigration sentiment is sort of across society, but often it's the it's the working class that are assumed to be the people who are anti-immigration. And I'm gonna come back to what that means now in a moment in terms of how the liberal media represents that. And if we could go to the next slide, if we go back to the 60s and 70s, we see that this was really explicitly tied to race. This idea of um, class and race was still very, very much at the forefront of thinking. And in a TV program called It Ain't Half Racist Mum, Stuart Hall explained that one of the tropes is to give a number of migrants in order to illustrate that too many people are coming into the country. Um, so what you see in this, in the, in these images, is images taken, I've taken from um, the Hall program, where he is using these images to illustrate how this sort of this act of representation is done. And what Hall says is as soon as you give a number, you can't quarrel with it because the number is a fact. And however many people you're talking about, it's always going to be too much. And so here in this first image at the top, you can see this, this in what this image is showing is that the it's suggesting that people, depending on their race, will have different numbers of children. <laughs> this is related to the idea of overpopulation, overcrowding. And in this program, um, Hall um, analyzed contemporary coverage in 1979 of immigration and showed how so many of these images were used. So in this, in the, the, these bottom two images, what you see is an image of Wembley Stadium was used, and then that was show, uh, used to represent 100,000 people. And then all those small little white um, images that you can see, that's all the small Wembley stadiums that are representing how big Britain's so-called non-white population was and so this was really tied to the idea that there were too many immigrants coming into the country so that here you you're seeing um you saw in this kind of um presentation of the numbers this idea in particular because this was at the same around the same time as Enoch Powell that the working class were concerned about migration and this kind of population growth was a threat to working class stability in all kinds of ways and now it's not that nothing has changed between now and then certain forms of explicit racism have been sidelined, different in the different groups that are problematized, seen as a threat has changed, but much of this underlying ideology remains intact. So when there is an, an, some kind of anti-racist resistance in the liberal media, this can be covered and at times celebrated, but actually the more radical demands of certain anti-racist groups are often glossed over or treated as unrealistic. And 
So, and what's really ignored is how really some of the core thinking of liberalism sustains racialized inequalities. This was really, really rarely um, examined. And so I'm going to try and skip to now very briefly to think about how this is the case. So if we could go to the next slide. Okay, so if we connect this to now, I went through some of the recent images that The Guardian have used um, in relation to stories about migration. And you often find the images that are used are images of politicians like Priti Patel or others who are sort of making negative statements around migration. But you also have this kind of dual representation going on. One, which you'll see here on the left hand side, is a very classic image of people arriving to the UK on boats. Um, this seems to be quite a matter of fact presentation of what's going on when certain journalists, um, not just in the liberal media, but in the right wing media are questioned about this. They say that all they're doing is showing people arriving and this is sort of a, a factual, it, it's kind of fact report, reporting factually on what is happening. Um, but really, there is still this kind of underlying idea about numbers. So there is this thinking that masses of people um, are coming to the UK, the boats are really overcrowded, which is actually a result of government policy. But what the image shows is it, it resonates with popular thinking around the country being sort of under siege, if you like, from people arriving. And there is this thinking of these masses of people on boats, which is obviously inherently dehumanizing. And this is one of the dominant messages that pe people take, take in around immigration. And there's also a real issue here of consent, I think. People are incredibly desperate, making this very, very risky, very dangerous crossing. And in the process, they're being photographed um, arriving to the UK. And I think it's, it's really, really, for me, quite a, a muddy area in terms of what is happening there in terms of, of their consent with, with photographs and what their position is in relation to the power. There's obviously a power dynamic there. Um, and a large part of the reason for, for, for this, this sort of underlying problems of these images is that lots of the media, including The Guardian, has treated people's movement as a problem. And it's something that must be managed to some degree or another. And I might not have time to talk about this because I realize I'm risk running over. So I'll have to cut this slightly short. But I think if for now it's sort of worth noting that as well as being really, really dehumanizing, um, these and giving this image of like there being too many people, I think it totally, these images totally ignore and gloss over why it is that people are having to move in this way, the kind of violent work that bordering regimes are doing to stop them from being able to safely come into the country. And even the times when government policy is scrutinized, it is the conservative government's policies as being seen as like the ex excesses or the extremes. So if you think about who is looking at these kinds of images in terms of a liberal audience, it I don't, not to stereotype, but there is a kind of um, a, a pro-EU sentiment amongst certain groups where there will be very, very little consideration actually of the fact that this is a this this extends to the EU border too. And so it's not only that it's con the Conservative government that is pursuing these policies, it's that there are bordering policies at all. And so I think one of the problems with this kind of image is not only is there kind of an infantilization, as you see with this picture with the young young child being picked up by the border guard and these kinds of dehumanization, dehumanizing images with the, the overcrowded boats. There is also just a, a real glossing over of the fact that this is what bordering means in general. It means exclusion. It means certain forms of exclusion. And whilst there, is, there are um, arguably less violent forms of bordering and the Conservatives, for instance, are pursuing an incredibly violent bordering regime at the moment, um, there, bordering is an act of exclusion. And so these images really never get to that and they really don't encourage the people who are consuming this kind of media to get to it. And I'll just end on this one point. So I won't have time to get to thinking about developments. So maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. But there's a problem here as well in that there is a sort of ideal type victim with a lot of these images. And I, I just want to mention that one of the most evident examples of that is the image of Alan Kurdi, who I'm sure, I'm sure you all remember that image with the three-year-old child face down, drowned, dead on a, on a, on a beach. And I'm not going to show that image um, because I think that we don't need to see that image in order to understand the real violence of bordering. And whilst this was on the front page of 
um, papers across the world, um, there is a real specific way, as I've suggested, of reading this for liberal audiences, which is outrage that this has happened, and specifically anger at government policy. So we maybe do get to this point of critiquing the border. But I think there's two questions here that I will end on. First, as I suggested, we shouldn't see, have to see an image of a drowned toddler to know the cruelty of the border regime. And even when these images are um, are on, on display, there isn't really an in-depth examination of why this has happened. So, for instance, following the image of Alan Kurdi, there was a momentary sort of softening of EU border policy, but then it returned to normal. So in this way, there's a sort of gross fetishization of this death and of this kind of violence and dehumanization to then have very, very little response. And secondly, as I've suggested, this becomes even more problematic when you think of the celebration of the EU that has followed Brexit with very, very little attention to what is going on in terms of EU border policies. So certain politicians or political parties may be scrutinized, and this is often the role of liberal media to scrutinize certain, um, certain right-wing ideology, which makes sense to a degree. But then one of the problems is the overlap between the left and liberals is really left unexamined. So the example of that is that the overall problem of having borders is really, really rarely part of this discussion because borders continue to be seen, even in liberal media, as essential to keep out certain unwanted undesirables. And that takes us, I mean, I will end there, but we can talk about in the Q&A how the working class, in particular the white working class is sort of used, is um, is, is ventriloquized, as I've already said, uh, to is, is, is being the place where the people where anti-immigration sentiment is um, expressed. And this is a really, really flat one dimensional view of, of class. But yeah, maybe we can talk about that in a moment. I'll end there because I unfortunately ended up having too much content for the 10 minutes, as is always the case. Thank you very much, Maya, and a very um, rich um, presentation with lots to think about. Uh, I, I think that where you ended, on that overlap between all the, the, the kind of struggles that we get now between race and class and how they're positioned in particular ways is a really fascinating one. And, and particularly through the whole Brexit process, that idea of your, you know, the working class, a white, was always white. Why is it, you know, why, why is working class seen as solely white? And it was that whole idea that actually the, these were the left behind. These were the ones which actually we had to now take care of through stricter bordering processes and leaving the EU as being part of that. And I think that came across very, very strongly. And I, I will maybe ask a first question back to you in, in relation to your presentation, because you refer to it um, so directly around images making emotional appeals to audiences. Now, clearly, newspapers do that to sell papers as well. So there's a commercial process there and they are trying, but in the process, they're also foregrounding who we can see as human and who, what, who we should feel for, who we should actually be willing, which strangers we should be willing to care for and which, who we shouldn't, I think. And, and we see that very much within the hostile immigration policy environment that we're living under. Now, of course, The Guardian on the one hand, um, was very willing to expose some of the problems of the hostile immigration policy. And yet on the other, we get it replicating all of those um, really problematic um, kind of uh, representations of bordering that you spoke about so well. Uh, where do you think then this liberal eye is situated in relation to the representation of humanity? I know that's a big question but it seems to me to be at the core of what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And I suppose one of the ways of thinking about this, which you've already sort of um, nodded to, is that there are, there are ideal type victims, if you like. There are, that, there are ideal type uh, human beings in relation to when people are racialized as other. And so what I mean by that is if you think about um, something like the Windrush scandal, it, it was a scandal. It was absolutely appalling that those um, it, black British individuals were caught up in the hostile environment. But they, they in it came to they came to represent sort of an ideal type victim of the hostile environment, which is that they had they had citizenship, they'd worked here all their lives, they'd contributed in the right ways, and so there was an ability to represent them as human beings. But that 
kind of representation is so often lost on people who are deemed to be not the good migrant or not the the, the sort of right fit, if you like. <laughs> but I think that that fits quite well, albeit sadly at the moment with thinking about asylum policy and how that this is represented as there's a there's a real um there's a real understanding that the 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 sort of government policy is going in a really really even worse direction than it already it, worse than where it already is and so you have representations of people who are seeking asylum as being really desperate as being really in need and one these people have agency they're human beings they are more than just their asylum status and that that does get that does get into coverage in particular in the guardian in ways that it doesn't in other coverage but this is often sort of pitted against even if implicitly against people who aren't seeking asylum, who aren't refugees, people who are moving here for all kinds of other reasons, including thinking about trying to get work because they're, they're leaving um, places that are relatively poor for all kinds of reasons. And this is that, th I suppose this is what one of the issues is, is who is able to access full humanity and who is only able to e ever really access victimhood or a sort of negative humanity. And we really see that in international development coverage too, is as Luke said, there are certain images that would never be shown now. And this is for all kinds of reasons. But actually in my, in my slides, I did have some images of um, that is still shown, which is the of people in the so-called global south in, in poorer countries, where the message is really one of um, that they have no kind of agency, very little power. And if they do have power and agency, it's sort of within a very, very neoliberal framework, doing very kinds of specific work. And this is what my PhD was on. You see representations of people in poverty in different countries, still in a really, a, a, a very sort of infantilizing way. And so that access to humanity then is sort of, mediate it through who is seen to be suitable to in order to work in the right way or present themselves in the right way and uh, uh, while other individuals are sort of seen as sort of less than I, I would argue. Thank you and, and Luke picking up on that process of the ways in which um, photographs are chosen, the ways in which they're edited that you spoke about, you know, it, Talk us through how that happens on a daily basis. So when, when um, because they're defining who the public are in that process and the type of public culture that, that is being embraced by that paper. Uh, so how do we recognize those in these photographs and how, how explicit is that in that decision-making? Well, um, I, I was struck by the images that Maya showed of the recent immigrants coming off boats because um, I think there is a great reticence now, at least, um, with picture editors about how images are used. And those were all very distant shots, no faces, no names, and c completely different to the one I showed earlier from the 1960s of the Kenyan immigrants, you know, who were, but of course they looked very middle class, they had lots of luggage. The, you know, and the sort of article that went with it was very wholesome and talked about welcoming them. So, I mean, it, it, it's a long way of saying you, you can kind of images, and I, I hope people sort of understand this when they go to see the exhibition, images are unbelievably amenable to any kind of meaning. You know, and many of the images that are in the show could just as easily have been in the right wing press as in The Guardian. It is all about the framing and the context in which it happens. And, um, you know, <laughs> I was kind of laughing when Maya was talking about, you know, you know, as an Irish person living here, I'm regularly asked, I, well, you must be from a big family. You know, <laughs> like people don't understand, you know, because I'm not of colour, you know, the, the kind of subtle racism or whenever Catholics are mentioned in the broadcast media here, there it's always um, said that they were devout Catholic, you know, be, you know, that business of the allegiance to Rome. People don't even hear it here. They're so inured to it. So the, the context in which I'd frame this is that, you know, racism exists everywhere in the liberal media, just as much as um, in the right wing press. And I suppose at least in The Guardian, there's some kind of acknowledgement that those forces are at work and that people need to be vigilant and they need to constantly revise what they do. However, that doesn't mean that they're not complicit in a lot of what happens. Yeah, just to come back on that, really, because they, they clearly think about what they shouldn't be doing. 
that would be <laughs> offensive or that, that that's a step too far. But at what point do they think about what they should be doing? You know, what is it that actually, what type of photograph could actually, um, you know, give power, could actually um, confer agency, could actually, you know, be anti-discriminatory? <laughs> But I think, I mean, in a sense, I'm not sure that photojournalism is the best at this. I mean, you think of, you know, war photography, but, you know, that has all of its own difficulties as well, because um, it's very much a male, you know, an expression of a particular kind of macho, you know, machismo. Um, but, um, but, but things then happen like the I know it's not a photograph, but the George Floyd thing happened, you know, that caught on camera and that has at least opened something up. So change might happen, but it takes something extraordinary like that. Um, and I'm not sure photojournalism does that very often. You know, that was a citizen journalist. That was a, somebody on the side of the road with a, a phone. So I think um, everything has moved on. You know, it's almost like um, photojournalism. I don't know what how it could function anymore. I'm, go I'm going to take some questions from the chat here because I've got a couple um, coming through. So please do um, continue to add them. Um, a, a question from John. It's been lovely to hear the discomfort around surrounding representation that exists today articulated so well. This is a question for Maya. But I was just wondering if you could share what, in your opinion, a reconsidered approach would look or sound like in the context of modern news telling? And I think it's a great question. And it's really, you know, OK, if not this, then what? How do we change it? Yeah, I think, um, it, yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I think that there's actually very good examples of the kinds of reporting that um, that does shift the, 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 the sort of framing. It, one of the problems, I suppose, and I'll I'll give some examples in a moment, but I guess one of the problems is that these often sit alongside other forms of reporting that reinforce dominant narratives. And so I think a very good example that I've mentioned is the reporting around Windrush, um, uh, the, the, the so-called Windrush scandal. There was like really space for people to explain what had happened to them. To, like uh, the, 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 the amount of column inches that were given to the people who'd been so subjected to, so awfully subjected to home office policy was really great and really important. Um, and the kind of reporting that does shift and does change things and does hold power to account. I suppose the, the problem then for me was that in certain forms of that reporting, it was like reinforcing the framing around illegal immigration, saying these people were illegal, um, almost like kind of playing implicitly into government policy, which was to respond, to, which was to say that, um, you know, that we need to maintain the hostile environment in order to target illegal immigrants. What you could then see, I guess, if I if I was going to suggest something, and this may exist in some um, parts of the Guardian, because as I say, the coverage is far more diverse than you would find in many, many other places, um, would be to speak to people who are undocumented about all the reasons that are, they're undocumented and give space to those people to talk about their, the impact of government policy on them. And yes, that's not necessarily going to cause the same kind of shift that Windrush did, because the whole the, the reason that did kind of strike the public mood was because it was people saw it as so grossly and just within the existing system. So even within the dominant thinking. But if you want to shift the debate, that's one of the ways that you can begin to do it and to sort of give people the space, give people this, give people who don't usually get the space to be heard and not just to treat them as victims, but do that kind of in-depth reporting. And one of one of the problems, I suppose, is the money for that. Um, but I was thinking when um when the discussion's been going on is. You know the purpose of the of the media as I see it is to 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 speak tr truth to power in sort of the most basic way. And one of the problems is is who is seen as powerless and when. Um, and making sure that those people who don't have the power, don't have the space, are given it. That to me would be a, a, a far better way to represent and to represent what is going on in terms of immigration, for instance, and to try to change and shift things. And I mean that also points very. You know, how do people do that? How do journalists and photographers do that when you actually need 
more journalists and photographers who aren't Oxbridge graduates and who aren't just from a particular elite section of society in order to, to gain access to that. And then, then you do see things. It's not the a magic bullet, but it does, things do start to shift if you actually have uh, you know, a constituency within the news media who are diverse and representative of the community, you know, I do think then you start to um, make some changes uh, in the context. Coming back to that question of context and another comment in the chat box here, you know, Luke mentioned that some of these photographs, if you take them away from the fact that they're in a newspaper with a particular headline, and a particular story, you could read in very different ways. So the framing of the newspaper um, it is how those um, pictures are understood. And the question in the chat is, uh, uh, what are the protocols or procedures for captioning? Because I don't think people really understand both a how headlines are written, but also how captions to pictures come about. Um, well, I'm not a picture editor, nor did I ever work as one. But um, again, there's there are now dozens of people because the Guardian sort of goes big on photographs now, with um, particularly with the online content. But again, without knowing it in any kind of detail, there are really strict procedures about how captioning happens and how it should be done, and um, you know there are also very strict rules images cannot be mediated in any way unless it's important to do it and then it has to be acknowledged um so there's there there is a there is a code of practice around which is being developed and constantly you know continually refined and the guardian is you know kind of the best at this because at least it's aware that there's an issue around it yeah i think that's a really good point and the um, kind of understanding how those processes work. I know, you know, headlines, for example, are not written by the journalists who write the piece itself. They're written um, entirely separately and often to capture people into a story because we know that lots of people will only read the first couple of paragraphs. So, you know, that's, that's also an issue. But coming back to one of the points that Maya was making about um, how we interrogate issues and stories in a way that actually exposes the structural dynamics of things like racism and immigration so that it's not just a, a kind of story about these uh, you know overcrowding or people coming in we actually understand the history that's gone before and the struggles related to that and, and I think part of the problem I have with some of the Guardian's liberal stances is yet it comes over as, you know, of course, racism is very bad and it's very happy to cover uh, you know, um, anti-racism or protests and to talk about, you know, position National Front demonstrations as a bad thing. But what we don't get is a real understanding of systemic structural racism in society. So it's only ever extremes. And I think that hides a huge amount in that you know, unwillingness, if you like, of the liberal eye to really interrogate the structures they're part of, which are upholding a particular ideology. And, and there is a kind of a, um, you know, I hate to use the word, but there is a kind of a smugness. If you, if you read The Guardian, as I do every day, you kind of know what you're going to get. Um, and it is about um, wanting to, you know, participate in a debate with like-minded people. But and, and the other thing that it seems to me that has shifted fairly recently is that, you know, the Guardian was always there or is the paper that, you know, truth to power. But that has that kind of contract, you know, has broken down completely. Nobody resigns anymore. It doesn't matter what you're caught doing. You know, they, you know, the government is flagrant or many ministers in, you know, breaches of protocol. Um, so what, you know, we are now in completely new territory. Um, yeah, no, I, that's absolutely right. And how do you hold truth to power in that context? And then, I mean, that comes back to something you were saying earlier, Luke, that I was quite struck by as well, is that it, it particularly into the um, back historically to the Guardian's representation of the suffrage movement and how they were very supportive of the suffrage of women. But actually, as soon as it came to violent demonstrations, they, um, they were completely against it. And how we see that replicated 
time and again. So it's very good to have a peaceful yes. demonstration that's not going to nice be middle class. <laughs> yeah, nice middle class de demonstration. Please I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's another selection of photographs in one of the cases of um, Gandhi. And um, while being initially kind of supportive of independence, um, C.P. Scott wrote the most scurrilous letter about his last meeting with Gandhi in 1931, saying, oh, he's banging on about his independence. And if that's all, he came over here to talk about, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's that business of liberalism again, about allowing enough to change to sort of move to the next stage, but nothing radical, nothing too upsetting. And, you know, obviously Ireland was central to its thinking as well for a, a long time. Yeah, there's some great pictures there as well of some um, issues around Northern Ireland that come through in the in the exhibition itself. Yeah, um, they're, they're, sorry to interrupt, but the most poignant one is the back of Bernadette Devlin at an anti-internment rally in um, London in the 1960s. Um, you know, and you just think, had anybody listened to her, <laughs> we wouldn't have had to go through 30 years of what we did. Can I also then move to talk a bit about the role of pictures in The Guardian now? Because we've had this recent, well, not that recent, I can't remember how many years it's been now, but the innovation of the double page picture spread that's come into, that, that, that actually I was quite disconcerted by. I know they're beautiful pictures, but they tend to exoticize. A, a lot of things a lot of the time and uh, I, and I I struggle to see the purpose of those photographs there in news terms I struggle to see their purpose so what are they doing what are they trying to do in that moment and well, is it good or is it damaging well I think it's um I think um, I kind of like the center pitch threads because they're a bit of a relief from all of the news and you're right they tend to be very exotic um sort of very, in many cases, very stereotypical images. Um, and, you know, one of the things that struck me in going through literally tens of thousands of files is photo journalists, by and large, end up taking the same photograph. You know, there's endless shots of the developing world of the Middle East. And if it's one about, you know, sort of, sort of prosperity, what you get is, a donkey with a cart or a tent and then a high rise in the background. You know, it's like these stock images that over and over again get replicated in completely different countries. Um, so, and that, that, that kind of goes back to the point about people who read The Guardian and who are liberal and left of centre and all that are reassured by seeing something that they recognise and an iconography that's familiar. But the interrogation of that is something completely different. And that also kind of comes back to a political economy of the newspaper itself. You know, photographers actually pretty ropey deal. It's pretty hard to get your photographs sold and yeah. into newspapers. It, it's a tough gig. Um, and, and so they reproduce, I think, what they think this liberal middle class elite are looking for in this newspaper without challenging those judges. They don't have that opportunity to challenge. So the responsibility lies with the editorial functions within The Guardian. But there's also a huge amount of photography. I mean, I don't look at all the online galleries. There's just vast amounts of stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. There is a huge archive. I'm conscious that we're coming to the end. Please do post any other questions or comments that you have. And I'm going to ask um, both of our panelists, Luca Meyer, um, to to you know, are, are there any final residing feelings that you have over the exhibition or over and and also, you know, what you think, um, you know, is if there was one thing you would want to change in how photographs in the Guardian are represented, what would it be? So um, I'm going to start with Luke and end with Maya. Um, I, that's a huge question. I mean, one of the abiding things that um, became apparent to me going through the is that the all of the stuff that has you know ricocheted around British society for the last ten years is all there. You know, since the nineteen fifties, the you know obsession with emigration, the obsession with Europe, um, you know, women's issues, gay rights, all of that stuff 
has a very long um, tradition within this culture. And the other thing, looking at them, even in the case of the Guardian, the obsession here with class, with the royal family, with the military, um, and it's all kind of assumed, you know, it's all um, sort of accepted. So it's the sort of archive is an extraordinary way of kind of understanding that by coming at it tangentially. But there are huge structural problems, <laughs> it seems to me, that um, have been apparent for a very long time and now it's exploded. And I have no idea what you would do <laughs> <laughs> other than to say a few things that would probably mean I would have to emigrate. <laughs> around the royal family in particular. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Luke later and he'll tell you uh, over a drink in the pub. Uh, Maya? Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree with a lot of that, not least the royal family. Um, and I mean, it's sort of, yeah, I mean, I won't go down that road either. <laughs> um, but I, I, I guess for me is is really the, the context within which these images are being shown because they can mean so many different things and it is the framing, it is sort of the consistent framing of certain issues. And I think there's been some, like going back to John's question, which I think is a really, really good question, is that I was thinking about some of the really good coverage that there's been recently in The Guardian, thinking about some of the coverage of the Batley and Spen election was really a place where some of the dominant narratives around Muslims that you would see in the, the rest of the press were being challenged in quite important ways. In really that space that I was talking about was really being given to people to, to, to sort of not reproduce these very, very racialized, this very, very racialized thinking. Um, but the problem is that this sits alongside other narratives that then end up entrenching this the, the, the same thinking that the, a lot of the media is reproducing. And I, I sort of just to end, I feel like I must. I guess I must sort of mention since we're th thinking about the Guardian you know one issue that we haven't mentioned is thinking about trans rights and the really poor coverage um, of trans rights that we've seen in the Guardian recently is a, a real sign of actually things could be done much much better in a way that is much much more attentive to the kinds of discrimination that's going on as opposed to reproducing what is a really really toxic sort of like an open sewer in the British press around the rights of trans people and this sort of consistent attack um I think this is that's a good example where the Guardian could do something very very different and at the moment it's sort of failing to and it's a real shame because in some of these other issues around say immigration you do have these spots of really important and good, challenging reporting that then I think gives some of the images a very, very different meaning. Um, so yeah, more of the, I think I'd like to see more of the speaking truth to power that we do see on the pages of The Guardian, but that unfortunately sits alongside some less, less, uh, less positive kinds of um, representation, I think. Thank you, Maya, and I uh, thank you very much for drawing attention to the um, transphobia issues and um, the ways in which the Guardian has covered trans rights. I think that plays into that particular um, kind of centrist left politics that and um, centrist feminism that um, has it, it's become been shown to be hugely problematic, and yet they have shied away from entirely in tackling properly. Thank you so much to Maya and to Luke for a wonderfully illuminating discussion and to the Photographer's Gallery for hosting the talk. I think my takeaway will be that the paper frames the pictures and we need a very different sort of paper <laughs> committed actually not so much to the tweaking and taming of capitalism but to a very newly imagined kind of radically democratic socially transformed society and that would have to mean then recognizing interrogating structures of inequality and discrimination that are so much part and parcel of our social order that you know remain so deeply unchallenged and I think that this discussion has exposed so well so thank you so much to our brilliant speakers and over to Janice for the closing words. Thank you so much to you, Natalie Fenton, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Maya Goodfellow, and to Luke Dodd. Um, we're really pleased that the exhibition has been super popular. It's continuing on, as I say, um, for a week on Sunday. Um, so please do, um, do please do join us. Come back, visit, 
visit again. Um, and I just wanted to say that next week on Thursday, the 23rd of September, uh, Karen McQuaid, one of the co-curators of the Picture Library, will also be giving a talk online. So please do join us. And thanks. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye. I think that's just us left, is it? <laughs> yeah, I was just waiting to say goodbye. I think the others are gone. <laughs>